Good afternoon. Welcome to our event where we are going to talk about can federal dollars be used to reduce mass incarceration. I'm Nicole Austin Hillary and I'm the director and counsel of the Washington office of the Brennan Center for Justice and we are very pleased to see such a lively uh, and bountiful room today. We're very excited. We know there are lots of things going on in Washington today and there are many other places that you can be but we are so happy that you chose to be here with us today to talk about this very important topic. Uh, before I uh, get into uh, some more of the substance, um, I have to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you know these events do not happen serendipitously. There are wonderful people who help to put them together um, and who, as I like to say, make us look good. Uh, so I want to take a brief moment to thank all of those people. Um, and these are my fellow Brennan Center staff members. Um, and they just do have done a yeoman's job of putting this together, as you can see. Um, and I want to make sure that they know how very much we appreciate them. Uh, so um, John Cowell, uh, who's not here with us today, who's our Vice President of Programs, uh, we'd like to thank him. Uh, Janine plant Churlin, Desiree Rayner, Jeffreen Uden, Kimberly Lebrano, Naren Daniel, L.B. Eisen, Nicole Fortier, Julia Bowling, Abigail Finkelman, Danielle Solomon, and Sophia Kirby. Thank you all for your collaborative and wonderful work in helping us to pull this together today. So enough with the housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and, and I, will, I will only share a little, bit, a little bit of this with you because I, I'm assuming because you're here, you know who the Brennan Center is and what we do. But just a brief reminder, and there may be a quiz afterwards. Uh, the Brennan Center is a national legal advocacy organization. We are part think tank, part law firm, uh, part research organization. And we focus on improving our systems of democracy and justice. And we do that by working uh, in three overarching arenas uh, on democracy issues, justice issues, and liberty and national security. And we uh, employ what I like to call a triumvirate uh, of mechanisms to do our work. Uh, we litigate, we use advocacy, research, uh, and I guess I can't use triumvirate anymore because communications is a huge part of what we do, so I've got to come up with another, another word. Uh, but we employ all of those mechanisms uh, to help do the things that we do and to bring attention to, to key reform issues, uh, which is one of the things that we're doing today. Uh, our justice program, which is the part of the Brennan Center that is responsible for the report that we're here to talk about today, uh, is our program that focuses on making sure that we have equal justice for all. Uh, and we do that by focusing on an array of issues, but most importantly, we focus on the issue of mass incarceration. And all the ancillary issues that we work on are all done so with a goal towards helping to end, uh, or at least help to uh, bring down uh, the, the problem of mass incarceration incarceration in this country. Um, our DC office that I help to oversee uh, works on uh, serving as the advocacy arm of the Brennan Center. So we're the eyes and ears of the organization here in Washington, working with many of you who are our coalition partners here and working uh, with the administration uh, and Congress. Uh, and uh, Michael Waldman, uh, who's immediately to my left, is our president. And I'm going to turn this program over to Michael, who will tell you a bit more about our fabulous report and today's program. But in the meantime, thank you and enjoy, and we're looking forward to engaging in today's discussion with you. Michael. Thank you so much, Nicole, and uh, thank you all for being here. And we, we uh, first off, want to make sure that you all get lunch. Um, I, I'm looking forward very much to seeing what having that many tuna melt sandwiches spread out across an audience looks like. Um, and uh, it's also, uh, for those of us who are based in New York, it is great to be here the day after the great blizzard of 2013, which I lived in Washington, D.C. temporarily for 14 years, and I know that uh, an inch or two of snow shuts the airports, schools, and government down, and even better than Congress could ever dream of doing. Um, we, uh, we're really thrilled to be able to convene this conversation on a really critical and exciting topic for the country. And I want to give you a little bit of context about why we're focused on this and uh, the nature of our work, uh, and then tell you about the panelists we have today. Um, right now, looking at it in the sweep of several decades, we're really at an extraordinary moment of promise and opportunity, I think, on criminal justice policy in the United States, where a lot of the old stale debates are over, where a lot of the invective has died down, and where there's new opportunities to uh, work together for innovative, uh, creative, and data-driven reforms that could really make 
an even bigger difference. There are several trends happening at once that people have noticed uh, and that fuel this. One, of course, is the remarkable success in the country at bringing down crime, at reducing violence, uh, which has made it such a difference in so many lives. Um, and, uh, and we see that in so many places, in so many ways, and that is the fruit of a lot of work by a lot of you and so many people around the country. At the same time, and possibly because the fear has diminished, we've noticed that the country now, with 5% of the world's population, has 25% of the world's prison population. And we all think that there must be something that can be done to improve that, too. And the good news is that there really is, across the country, in states and cities and here at the federal level, a wave of innovative reforms of new law enforcement techniques, of new policing, of new policies that have both helped create this moment and that we would like to do our part to help drive forward. Uh, hence the Brennan Center's new institutional focus in a major way on mass incarceration and on really the twin goals of both keeping the country and people safe and reducing unnecessary uh, entanglement in the criminal justice system. And part of what we do in this work is advocate, but part is also to look at policies and policy proposals uh, that could be steps taken by various parts of the government uh, to help advance justice in this way. And one of the things we'd like to make sure we talk about is a new proposal that, that we've just put out, which you will hear about from one of the co-authors of the proposal, uh, Enimai Chetiar. And I should acknowledge two her co-authors on this report who are both here, um, L.B. Eisen, Lauren Brooke Eisen, and Nicole Fortier. And we're grateful uh, to all of them, and we certainly hope that you all have a chance to read this. Um, this report, as probably most of you know, asks the question of how can we take the significant flows of federal funds that go to states and cities uh, for criminal justice, how can we make sure that while they're doing the other things they ought to be doing, that they help us continue the progress on reducing mass incarceration? Not the only goal, but a significant goal. This particular report, as you'll hear, focuses on the JAG program. Uh, and it was quite an interesting process for us in doing the work to craft this. Uh, our colleagues spoke to over 100 stakeholders. Uh, we were able to convene a blue ribbon panel that a number of you were able to participate in um, of leading experts and, and policymakers and practitioners from law enforcement, from pr the prosecuting world, from indigent defense, from the federal government, from uh, the philanthropic world. And as we make very clear, we are deeply grateful for the input and advice, and we know that, uh, that the results are, are ours, uh, and, and uh, that we uh, benefit enormously from that independent kicking of the tires that took place. Uh, we've also benefited in this work from economic thinking and new economic thinking, and we're very proud that Peter Orzag, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget and of the Congressional Budget Office, wrote the foreword and, and actually uh, likened this to Moneyball, which was kind of cool because we were wondering who Brad Pitt plays in the, in the movie of this report. Um, uh, and we benefited also from the lessons learned from the real wave of reform that we see happening toward metrics, toward results-based law enforcement all across the country. Uh, again, so many of you are a part of this. Um, the National Criminal Justice Association and police chiefs and states are trying different innovations and different creative ways to make sure that these funds are used in effective and data-driven ways. Um, several states, Texas and Illinois and California, are working right now uh, to find ways to improve the way their federal funds are used, again, along the same lines of making sure that we focus on what works. And of course, the Justice Department itself, which administers uh, this particular program, has made significant efforts, taken significant strides, and really has tried to push forward its own reforms under Carol Mason and Lori Robinson. Uh, and it, we are appreciative for their efforts to move funds to indigent defense, to move states to data-driven practices, a whole menu of things. 
Um, and this whole concatenation of efforts around the country, what we hope with this work that we're doing will be to help push further uh, to take these positive trends and do what we can to help drive them forward, how to take them to the next level. So to discuss this idea in our report, but more broadly, the uh, ways in which we're learning to do better at criminal justice policy. We're really lucky to have uh, several experts and practitioners who are, who are helping drive this. Um, and we'll hear from each of them and have a chance for questions and discussion from all of you. Uh, I'll introduce them first before, before we talk. First of all, to my immediate left uh, is Eni Machetiar. Uh, as you've heard, she is the director of the justice program at the Brennan Center for Justice, which I should say is affiliated with NYU School of Law in New York City. She is a leading and an emerging national voice on uh, these issues on ending mass incarceration, especially focusing on the application of economic concepts to these issues. Um, and uh, we are fortunate to have her here today too, not because of snow, but because she is serving as the co-chair of Mayor-elect de Blasio's uh, transition task force on public safety. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, grateful uh, for your work there. To her left, um, as, as many of you know, Dean Esserman was going to be joining us. He is the uh, chief of police of New Haven, Connecticut. He was unable to make it down, uh, and we're really delighted to have a, a, uh, a powerful uh, colleague to, to uh, step, into, step into those uh, shoes. Jim Bierman, as many of you know, is the president of the Police Foundation, uh, a national leading nonpartisan nonprofit group dedicated to supporting innovation and improving research and proving policing, a 33-year veteran himself of the Redlands Police Department, and as you know, one of the leading thinkers uh, on policing issues in the country. Um, and to his left, Mark Levin is the director of the Center for Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And he is also the policy director for Right on Crime, which is the group uh, that w uh, brings together leading conservatives, uh, Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist and others, uh, who push for reform of the criminal justice system and who are part of, the, as I say, this really tremendous coming together across ideological uh, categories that don't make so much sense anymore in this area uh, on criminal justice. Um, and finally, to his left, uh, Nikichi Taifa is the senior policy analyst at the Open Society Foundations working on these issues. She has been a leading criminal justice and civil rights advocate for decades, somebody we've had the privilege to work with for a long time. Uh, she has helped tee up this reform movement around the country. And before OSF, she was a legislative counsel for the ACLU and its principal spokesperson on criminal justice and civil rights. So we're really thrilled to have all of you here. And let me start off the conversation by asking Enemai just to give us a sense of what the nub is of this proposal. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, in addition to thanking my co-authors, I actually also wanted to thank our contributor, Tim Ross. So the big takeaway here is that our proposal would leverage funding to achieve the twin goals of reducing mass incarceration and reducing crime and that we think that this plan could help shift policies nationwide in this direction. So as Michael mentioned, our proposal focuses on the nation's largest criminal justice grant program called Burn JAG, or JAG for short. It's run by the Justice Department, and each year JAG sends mil hundreds of millions of dollars to all 50 states and thousands of cities across the country. While initially a noble program with the best of intentions, JAG is now running on autopilot. And that inadvertently encourages mass incarceration. And to be clear, when we say mass incarceration, we mean far more than just the number of people in prison. We also mean the explosion in the number of people in our justice system. Prison, probation, parole, jails, arrests, criminal records. Currently, when DOJ gives out JAG funds, it asks recipients a series of questions that accompany these funds, asking them what they did with the money. 
So for example, it asks states to report on the number of arrests, but not on whether the crime rate dropped. It asks states to report on the amount of cocaine seized, but not on whether arrestees with drug addiction were diverted. It tallies the number of cases prosecuted, but not whether prosecutors reduce the number of people sent to prison. Our reform is simple. And I'm sure you're w sitting there wondering how our reform could possibly be simple when you're sitting there with a 60-page report. So as you know, lawyers are not known for our brevity. <laughs> but this report is, in fact, simple. Change the questions that accompany the dollars. When you change the questions, you change expectations. And when you change expectations, you change the incentives. And when you change the incentives, you can change the system. The good news, as Michael mentioned, is that DOJ can do this without waiting for Congress to act. And DOJ is already moving in this direction. Along with NCJA, DOJ is encouraging states to move in this direction to spend the funds on better uses. What we're proposing is a more aggressive change that we think is really needed to move the needle on this issue. So there are three main purposes of our proposal. So first, our new questions would send a clear signal to states and cities that the dual goals of reducing mass incarceration and reducing crime can go hand in hand. These signals are as influential as the funding. Even if these questions don't directly accompany or link to the dollars, they're still setting expectations. We can't reduce the number of people arrested if we are focused on arresting more people. And we can't reduce the number of people prosecuted if we are focused on prosecuting more people. And we definitely can't reduce the number of people in prison if we are focused on funneling more and more people into the justice system. Our questions would focus on the right goals. It would reorient the system by asking questions like whether the crime rate dropped, were arrestees screened for drug addiction and diverted from prosecution? Were petty offenders diverted from prison? There are two more things that our proposal would do. It would effectively focus on public safety priorities. And it would hold recipients more accountable for how they spent scarce government dollars. And we're calling for this reform across the board in criminal justice. At its heart, this is not a liberal reform. And it's not a conservative reform. It's a common sense reform. People across the country are coming to the realization that we are simply locking up way too many people in this country. We're really hoping that this proposal can help move us toward a more effective, just, and smaller system. And I really look forward to the discussion, and I'm very excited to hear everyone's thoughts. Thank you so much, Inamai. Um, Jim, uh, one of the premises of this report is that there are better methods of policing uh, that have been developed and are being deployed. And as one of the leaders in law enforcement who's run a police department, and uh, your colleagues in your organization are, have run or are running police departments, what role do you think this kind of focus and this kind of proposal can, can have in moving toward more effective uh, law enforcement? So I'd like to frame my comments around a couple of uh, things, and, and critical to those is understanding where I come from, which is uh, California, the land of mass incarceration, right? Nobody does it better than California does. At its peak, we had 33 state prisons with over 300,000 people in, under the supervision of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Not sure why it's called rehabilitation. Um, and I can tell you from working within that system that that is not working and, and you see these massive um, structural changes underway right now called realignment. So the public safety realignment in California is moving ahead full steam. Um, whether or not it's effective or not, I think the jury is still out on that. But a lot of my perspectives on why this is so important and why the, this focus on outcomes as opposed to outputs is so important is framed by that experience 
and my own at uh, my police department, which is located east of Los Angeles, where we reframed our policing model around an evidence-based approach called risk and protective focus prevention, because we got our head around many years ago the, the, per the fundamental purpose of the police department, which was to control crime before it occurred. We thought that preventing crime and all of its collateral consequences was what the taxpayers in our community expected and certainly what the families and, and the people that we serve needed. So we, um, using, quite frankly, U.S. Department of Justice resources, looked at um, this policing model and were clear about a balanced and comprehensive approach incorporating prevention, intervention, and suppression uh, components. So in our model, um, the outcome we sought, because this model is based on a healthcare model, was about a safer community and was not about how many tickets we wrote or how many people we put in jail. It was about the quality of life for all of us. Um, and how do you use the funds they had? We were driven also by this notion that uh, we had to be good stewards of the taxpayer investment in the police department. And so we were able to talk about a variety of prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies in our community, whether we were talking to people that were uh, very progressive in their orientation or whether they were very conservative in their orientation. Because in my view, this isn't about progressive or liberal perspectives. It's not about conservative perspectives. This stuff either works or it doesn't work. It's either effective or it doesn't. It's ineffective. And um, how you measure that and how you get to that point when the system that you are using is aimed around numbers and the collection of numbers. And that starts in policing from the computer system, the computer-aided dispatch systems that we all use that are designed to count things, not measure things. And there's a huge difference in that. Um, all the way through our funding mechanisms. I would be remiss if I didn't say, I know uh, many people that work very hard and have been working very hard the entire length of my career um, in, um, as a police chief to help the system um, reframe around outcomes. And so at the Department of Justice, um, I think we would be remiss, again, if I didn't emphasize, as you, both of you have here a second ago, the great work that I think the people at the Department of Justice have done in terms of advancing evidence-based perspectives and smart policing initi initiatives, because they, and that's how I see this report, and these recommendations are about advancing the work that the Department of Justice has been about for a long time, not, it, not in conflict, but in fact advancing the great cause of looking at what is it we're trying to achieve. This was a fundamental question for all of us within my police department. And I, and I think good police chiefs and sheriffs and commissioners ask the same thing. What are we trying to achieve with the police department? What is it we're supposed to be doing? And, and the answer, putting handcuffs on as many people as we can, is not the answer. The, the answer is about, I think, controlling crime before it occurs where we can, using evidence-based approaches to help support strong families and resilient youth. And the police can play a role in that. And they can do that only if you begin changing the dialogue from how many people did you arrest to how many problems did you solve in the community? Who did you collaborate with? And did you, Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, Chief, did you co-produce a level of public safety in the community with your community partners? And you didn't do things to the community, you did things with the community. Now that's kind of a 5,000 foot view and it gets complicated because in all of that collaborative positive environment, the reality is there are a significant number of people who are very violent in our society who do need to be corralled and we do and that's what incarceration in my view should be re, um, reserved for california again is a perfect example of what not to do when you put everybody in jail pretty soon the system breaks this is not nuclear science right you don't have to i think think real deep about this to figure out that this is just not going to work at a certain point you hit a tipping point and then the system bursts when incarceration becomes the singular focus of everybody because the money that you give organizations is framed, their metrics for determining that are how many people you put in jail and that's what they're going to do. You know, what gets counted counts in their view. And reframing um, that question to how many problems did you solve, is your community safer as a result of this money, I think is the work that the Department of Justice has been about. That's fundamentally what this report is about, at least as my uh, recovering police chief ears hear that, right? That's how I hear that, is that it's consistent with this model of what are we trying to achieve in a community, can we achieve safety, and do it in a way where we maintain the legitimacy that the community expects and demands um, from the police department. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Moving on, yes. Um, Mark, um, the proposal and the report also recommends that states, separate and apart from this regulatory or this, this uh, action we're recommending at the federal level, that states move forward also in the direction of tying criminal justice funding to results. Um, and as, as an expert in, in the state systems, how do you see that working? And uh, how do you see states, whether or not the federal government is involved, how do you state, see states taking the impetus from this proposal, should this be implemented? Uh, and, and working with it? Sure, well, that's a great question, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, uh, congratulations on this report. I, um, I kind of feel like I've come full circle, but you know, we started working in Texas in 2005. I did on criminal justice reform for the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and of course, it was a success in Texas. We now have our lowest crime rate since 1968. We've closed prisons. Uh, that really has, uh, I think, been a uh, positive model for states across the country, and we've been able to take that uh, through right on crime uh, to testify and to work with policymakers in other states. But you know, in 2005, really the first major thing Texas did was a policy that said to probation departments, and we have 121 probation departments, by the way, if you will adopt a graduated sanctions to deal with violations like missing appointments, and you'll set a goal of 10% fewer technical revocations to prison by uh, targeting that, we'll give you an additional, uh, it was $50 million. And what we subsequently saw is those probation departments, which is the majority that participated, reduced their technical revocations by 16%. Those that didn't participate increased by 8%. We ended up saving more than twice what was spent on that program. And that's a perfect model for what we're talking about here today. And of course, most importantly, we were able to, that helped us reduce crime by getting more probationers compliant with their supervision and going to programs and so forth. So um, really, I think this builds on uh, what we've seen as successes across the country, and uh, there's a lot of uh, examples, including in the juvenile system. Uh, Reclaim in Ohio, which has uh, resulted in a dramatic reduction in incarceration as well as uh, juvenile uh, reoffending. And so these are kind of performance-based models that have not only caught on in this country, actually, but uh, were part of the manifesto issued several years ago by the Conservative Party in Great Britain. So it really does bring people together. And of course, uh, in this country, also on the uh, adult side, Illinois adopted a performance-based model. Uh, for some funding where 10 counties participated and uh, has resulted in 20% decline in recidivism, 16 million in avoided prison costs. So now, of course, this proposal here does not uh, actually, um, it, it, Congress, as you know, uh, has to make any changes that would actually directly tie to funding, but it does set performance measures. And it's kind of like, uh, who doesn't want to know the temperature in the room? And that's really what we're talking about here today. And um, uh, again, just to show you kind of the uh, cross pollination on this type of issue, the American Legislative Exchange Council, I'm uh, part of the Justice Performance uh, Task Force there, and myself and Jerry Madden have gotten a number of model bills passed, and um, among those are the correction, Community Corrections Performance Measure Act, and these are all available on, on the ALEC website, and they're similar to what many states have adopted, but that talks about measuring recidivism, employment, uh, desistance from substance abuse, restitution, compliance with uh, no contact orders with victims, and uh, successful discharges from probation, and says, Every state should know uh, what, uh, how those uh, measurements look in uh, their uh, community corrections departments across the state. And then secondly, uh, the Community Corrections Performance Incentive Funding Act, which talks about linking some funding to outcomes, including reduced recidivism, reduced substance abuse, uh, increased employment among offenders, and increased percentage of uh, those on community supervision who are, are compliant with restitution. Uh, so uh, this is really something that's, um, uh, and I'm not going to say this isn't an original idea in the report but is really building on a lot of what's being done across the country and across the aisle. So um, I think what we see as we look at performance measures at the federal level in this area is there's a focus on volume rather than on results. And so again, you look at uh, how many arrests, how many warrants were issued and things like that. And so um, you could really contrast that if you look at uh, uh, other uh, models. And so for example, what was done in New York City with regard to policing in the 1990s, George Kelling is one of the individuals who signed our statement of principles who work with Mayor Giuliani to put in, and Ray Kelly and others, to put in those policies in the 90s that, of course, we all know as CompStat and data-driven policing. And, and, and I hope you just wouldn't mind if I take a brief quote
quote from Mr. Kelly, because I think it's really important. He says, what over the last 30 years has the, quote, system produced? An endless temptation to spend money. The image of a system induces us to try to create a fiscal balance between the parts. More police mean more criminals arrested. More arrestees mean more prosecutors and judges to convict. More convicts mean more prisons and more parole and probation offices. But perhaps that idea is wrong. Perhaps instead of spending resources evenly over a system to process criminals, we need to concentrate them on the agencies that prevent crime. Perhaps to put it bluntly, we need fewer prisons and more cops. Not cops who will feed the system, but cops who will starve it by helping communities protect themselves. And I think that's similar to what we just heard. Um, and so uh, as we take it today, uh, Bill Bratton, who of course uh, Bill de Blasio just named his police chief, and uh, I was great to hear about your uh, role in advising him. I don't know that we'll, as an organization, probably won't, might be a long time till we agree with uh, something Mayor de Blasio does on other issues, but we're very pleased uh, with this. And uh, But he's talked about this too, and in fact, he said we need to uh, measure for improved outcomes. And that's what CompStat was partly about. It wasn't just about a computer. It was about having the commanders in those areas come in for meetings, look at the data even from last night, and hold them accountable for lowering crime in, in those areas. So uh, let me just uh, talk about a couple other things. One of them is, as you look at some another performance measure that's sometimes used in this program currently, deals with how, much, how many assets are seized. And um, there are problems. In fact, the Heritage Foundation just put out a report last week talking about asset for uh, civil asset forfeiture here in D.C. Talked about a guy who uh, made a, a turn on, on red or whatever and uh, ended up his car was um, confiscated because he had a gun, which turned out to be legal, and he was acquitted. And more than six months later, he was finally able to get his car back after posting a $1,000 bond. And this is a guy who was never convicted of anything. So uh, again, we don't want to incentivize that, though we recognize there is a valid role for asset forfeiture. And uh, one of the things that I think uh, someone may say to try to, you know, uh, perhaps be skeptical of, of the approach we're talking about here today is that it's more strings attached for the states, but it really isn't. It's actually just measuring performance. Um, and so uh, it doesn't say how you accomplish the goals that we're talking about here today. It simply measures and incentivizes positive outcomes, and it leaves uh, discretion to local entities to come up with creative uh, ways to use these funds. So um, I want to make just a couple more points, and then I'll wrap up. One is that uh, we know that a lot of the things that actually work to reduce incarceration, whether they're problem-solving courts or mental health uh, diversions and so forth, the, they require some upfront money. And that's where this program can, can help uh, really uh, seed that. And so um, a lot of times the savings are a bit down the road. Often in the same fiscal year or same biennium, you're able to uh, close a wing of a jail or close a prison, but you still do need that upfront uh, investment. And so that, that's a re this kind of counterbalances that uh, sometimes perverse incentive in the system, particularly when often that upfront investment has to be made at the local level and the savings occur at the state level. Uh, the other thing I will point out is um, I think, you know, we've heard a lot about stop and frisk, but how about stop and assess? And the interesting thing is stop and assess actually costs money to make an assessment. You know, we had a bill in the last session of the Texas legislature, which we were able to pass, uh, which allows for alternative dispute resolution, criminal alternative dispute resolution, such as victim offender mediation. We actually amended the civil ADR statute. Uh, but what we heard from some prosecutors was, you know, um, of course, they wanted to be the only ones who could refer cases to mediation, and we said fine. But then we heard from some in some of the big cities, they said, well, we don't have time to review the cases before they plea to decide whether they're appropriate for that. And then I was at a conference, and I heard the DA from Milwaukee say, you know, for years the legislature thought if they just gave us less money, we'll send less people to prison, and, and they'll have a you know, better budget. Well, it turns out when prosecutors, in his view, don't have time to evaluate a case, they end up just going with the default of a tougher sentence without actually have time to look at a case. And so he, for example, has gotten funding after a lot of pushing at the legislature in Wisconsin to have some community prosecutors who do those evaluations up front, figure out who could be safely put into a diversion program, whether for mental health or substance abuse or whatnot. And so I think that really challenges how we think about this. And then I'll just conclude by saying one thing the report didn't mention that I thought it could have was, you know, in 1994, we had this Federal Crime Act, $5 billion to the states to build more prisons, more state prisons, in exchange for adopting truth and sentencing uh, approaches. And as we know, of course, the mandate was only for violent crime. You have to serve 85% of your sentence. But many states took that and ran with it and said, we're going to do that for nonviolent crimes. And that's still the law in some of the states where we really see the prison population, the few that have really been on autopilot, like Florida and Arizona. There are the exceptions that have not done things like justice reinvestment. And they still have those 85% uh, laws for nonviolent offenders, and that continues to drive their 
their population. Um, so uh, the federal government played a large role in states being able to, frankly, from uh, the, it was a six-fold increase from the early 70s to the mid-2000s in incarceration in this country, and a lot of that was during the 90s, and states could not have come up with that money. I was in Mississippi where they doubled the prison population in the 90s. They could not have come up with that money but for that federal act. So I think here today we have an opportunity to uh, do something positive here at the federal level, and so I'm pleased to be here and be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. So, so many uh, interesting and, and meaty thoughts here, and we could probably have a, 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 a separate meeting on each one of them. Um, Nikichi, uh, w among other things, there is a debate among criminal justice advocates about the role and the appropriate role of these kinds of fiscal reforms, or more broadly of economic analysis uh, in this work. And you've been a longtime criminal justice advocate. You've focused especially on the racial justice aspects of this. How do you see uh, these economic approaches melding with, uh, with the best way to, to get needed change? Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank you and the Brennan Center uh, for this very, very timely uh, report and for your leadership in illuminating this very critical issue of the uh, role of uh, federal dollars in mass incarceration. Uh, but permit me to step back um, for just a moment, to step back in history to the early morning of uh, July 23rd, 1999, where nearly half of the African-American population uh, of Tulia, Texas, was rounded up, arrested, and paraded half uh, dressed through the streets on charges of drug trafficking. Uh, the rest were based solely on the uncorroborated um, allegations of a single officer whose testimony was later described by a Texas judge as, quote, absolutely riddled with perjury. Uh, the subsequent convictions resulted in the decimation of whole families. Uh, dozens of uh, children were uh, left virtually parentless. It was not until August of 2003 where uh, all of the Tulia defendants were pardoned, even though the officer had been characterized as, quote, the most devious, non-responsive law enforcement witness this court has witnessed in 25 years on the bench. Uh, the undercover officer, Tom Coleman, alleged that over an 18-month period, 46 Tulia residents sold him cocaine, all of which was worth less than $200. The first person to be tried was a 57-year-old hog farmer uh, who received a 90-year sentence after being convicted of selling uh, uh, one count of selling cocaine to Coleman. Others who went to trial received sentences of from 20 to 341 years. The arrests and convictions generated so much attention that Coleman was honored as Lawman of the Year um, in 1999 by then Texas Attorney General um, John Cornyn. Uh, two years later, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund got involved in the case to coordinate the litigation of the defense appeals. LDF found that all of the trials or pleas were marred by serious due process violations. The African American community was admittedly targeted for law enforcement scrutiny. The convictions were based solely on um, one narcotics officer with a dubious past whose modus operandi was to record purported drug buys on his arms and on his legs. There was no corroboration of his testimony in the form of a second officer, um, no audio or video surveillance, no photographs, no wiretaps. Um, LDF found an indifference on the part of law enforcement to ensure that their undercover officer was credible and trustworthy, that undercover op operation protocols were not observed to guarantee the validity of the officer's testimony, and that full disclosure was not made to the defense prior to trial about the character of the government's only witness. So to understand what went on in Tulia, Texas, one needs to understand the Byrne Grant program and the extent to which Byrne JAG funded drug task forces have become a national disgrace. The undercover officer who orchestrated the sting I was hired by the Panhandle's Regional Narcotics Tra Task Force, a drug interdiction unit funded by the federal Byrne JAG program and one of nearly 1,000 federally funded partnerships nationwide where local police departments, sheriff's officers, and dis district attorneys combined their efforts to fight the war on drugs. A key factor in the Tulia 
uh, fiasco was a dearth of federal oversight over the narcotics task force that hired the undercover agent. A report issued by the Drug Policy Alliance found that the lack of meaningful federal oversight over federal law enforcement grants for drug task forces resulted in the proliferation of corruption and racial disparities. A 2002 report issued by the ACLU of Texas identified numerous scandals involving burn funded task force narcotics, including tampering with government records, witness tampering, fabricating evidence, stealing drugs from um, evidence lockers, selling drugs to children, large-scale racial profiling, and unwarranted traffic stops, sexual harassment, and other abuses of official capacity. In essence, it appeared as if the burn funded task forces were quote, designed to fail because of structural flaws, misguided priorities, and fundamentally unaccountable management and hiring um, arrangements. Federally funded narcotics task forces have also been criticized for focusing their resources on investigations of small time drug sales that do little to stem the flow of drugs into communities and that their efforts are disproportionately focused on arresting people of color. Finally, the task forces have been criticized for the use of arrests and forfeitures as outcome measures to judge the success of the task forces because such goals not only reduce the incentive to find solutions to the drug problem, but actually encourage the kinds of behaviors that resulted in the Tulia scandal. The Edward um, uh, Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program, Byrne JAG, is currently the primary provider of federal criminal justice funding to state and local jurisdictions. Although the grant is intended to support a range of prevention um, and crime control programs and improve state and local criminal justice systems, its role in incentivizing incarceration has been criticized. One might say that although grant programs and other federal laws and policies uh, th th that through these programs that there is an unofficial narrative that has been established around how federal government expects state and local governments to approach issues of crime and public safety. In recent years, even though the feds have begun to step away from an exclusively prison-centric approach to justice and law enforcement, it has not successfully changed the narrative at the state level. I want to just step back again for a moment to provide a very broad brush snapshot of significant federal uh, legislative initiatives that have fueled this narrative, uh, which has culminated in the Burn uh, JAG program. Uh, we had the 1968 Omnibus um, Crime Control and Safe Streets Act in response to the increase of um, in national crime rate during the 60s. And the act created the Law Enforcement Administration um, Agency, LEAA, the precursor to the Office of Justice Programs, OJP. And LEAA provided federal grant funding for criminology and criminal justice research and funded block grants to support local law enforcement agencies. The law reiterated the role of the federal government in funding state and local efforts to address uh, public safety and crime. We had the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984, which included the Sentencing Reform Act, which created the U.S. Sentencing Commission responsible for the establishment of sentencing guidelines for federal courts. And many states followed suit in creating sentencing commissions and have been influenced by the federal guidelines as part of their own sentencing reform. There was a drug, um, uh, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, a central piece of legislation in the war on drugs. The act reinstated mandatory minimums for drug possessions despite past um, failures of such measures to decrease drug violations. The act significantly impacted state practices and policies by establishing federal grants to fund drug enforcement for st uh, states that adopted uh, similar practices. The act also ramped up civil asset forfeiture uh, seizures, allowing the transfer of seized property to any federal agency or any state or local law enforcement agency who participated directly in any of the acts leading to the seizure or the forfeiture of the property. In 1994, we had the largest crime bill in history, the Violent C Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act which further solidified the role of the federal government in funding state and local law enforcement efforts and reinforced the tough on crime mentality. The bill incentivized 
harsh penalties and lengthy sentences. Uh, the bill created the largest expansion of the death penalty in modern times, allowed 13-year-olds to be tried as adults, established three strikes laws, uh, mandated life imprisonment, ex excluded incarcerated people from receiving Pell educational grants, as, and established a one-time grant program for states that enacted their own truth in sentencing laws. Uh, this grant program awarded qualifying states federal funding for prison construction, contributing to the already growing prison population by incentivizing states to increase the length of time spent in prisons. Within one year, 11 states had adopted truth and sentencing laws, and by 1998, 28 states and the District of Columbia met the criteria established in the grant program. According to a 1998 GAO report, 15 of the 27 states reported that federal grants were a partial or key factor in deciding to adopt their truth in sentencing laws. Though no longer federally funded, the legacy of truth in sentencing policies funded by these, uh, this grant program continues to drive incarceration rates. Although states no longer receive funding to support truth in sentencing requirements, many continue to implement them, some more stringently than required by the federal government and at significant cost to taxpayers, uh, to state, and to the incarcerated. Fast forward to today, the Burn JAG program administered by uh, BJA is the cornerstone federal justice assistance grant program and the leading source of federal justice funding to state and local governments. Uh, we all know what Burn JAG provides to the states and tribes and um, local governments, um, et cetera, um, law enforcement, uh, prosecutors, courts, prevention and education corrections, community corrections, drug treatment enforcement, planning evaluation, technology improvement, and crime victim and witness initiatives. Though the current Burn JAG program has moved away from its focus on drug-related justice issues, it has left behind a legacy in the form of scandal-plagued regional drug task forces, such as the one in Tulia, which continue to receive and distribute federal burn JAG funding with this in states. And as highlighted um, in a recent ACLU report on the proliferation of marijuana arrests, policies remain that incentivize in arrests for minor offenses. Indeed, as reflected in that report, because arrest statistics, which include any arrests, including any drug arrests, are included in law enforcement's performance measures, police departments are likely uh, encouraged to increase their arrest numbers by targeting their limited resources on low-level drug users and possessors. Indeed, evaluating law enforcement agencies based on the numbers of stops, citations, summons, and arrests does not properly measure public safety and increases pressure on police officers and departments to aggressively enforce criminal laws for nonviolent offenses. Including arrests as a measure of productivity creates an incentive for police to selectively target poor and marginalized communities for enforcement of low-level offenses, as low-level offenses are committed more frequently than serious crimes. The arrests are, are, are less resource and time intensive than investigating arrests for serious um, felonies, and such arrests can be made most easily and at the least political uh, cost. And the pressure on police officers to quote unquote make their numbers results in a focus on aggressive stops and searches um, that sometimes flaunt the Fourth Amendment and lead to arrests for minor offenses, including marijuana uh, possession. There is a disconnect in perception as to whether Burn JAG and other federal justice grant programs serve to incentivize incarceration by imposing quantification metrics based on arrest quotas. Regardless, the current um, burn JAG performance measures questionnaires raises red flags. Questions 33 to 36 ask states and local grantees explicitly about the number of arrests made in the reporting period. Additional red flags on the questionnaire include questions regarding the amount of um, assets um, forfeited. As I come into a close, I just want to say that the federal government's performance metrics appear to focus primarily, although not exclusively, on inputs, as was reflected in the Brennan uh, report. These metrics do not appear to require the grantee to demonstrate how their use of funds help to reduce crime or to target law enforcement measures at the most violent offenders. Performance metrics could be revised to focus more on results, i.e., asking about how much a particular type of crime has been reduced during the grant period rather than the number of arrests that have occurred. 
As for statistics comparing the race of those arrested to the general demographics of the jurisdiction, um, further burn jag funding could be used to support prevention programs, although there's no mention of alternatives um, to incarceration or diversion programs included in the performance um, metrics. The Open Society is um, glad that Brennan and other groups are taking a look at the incentives and systems that promote incarceration. And we are glad that there is bipartisan attention um, uh, to reform. So I just want to um, go and include, uh, conclude by saying that we really need to look at, we need to follow the money and look at just how federal funding is um, adversely incentivizing the wrong things. Thank you so much, Nikichi. Now, uh, I know that uh, folks have questions or comments or thoughts they would like to add. And so I want to uh, say, first of all, that we have microphones. This is being recorded. Uh, so please ask your question with a microphone. And, and we would love it if you would uh, identify your, say your name and identify uh, your organization, if, if appropriate. I'm Bert Wides. Uh, <clears throat> pro bono advocate, but I worked on criminal justice issues in the Senate in the 70s and 80s and in the 90s or first decade 2000s in the House. And it's very heartening to see the wheel turning back. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, Senators Phil Hart, Kennedy, and Birch Bayh tried in LAA to put in a little bit of emphasis on these kinds of reforms, such as segregation of juveniles and some incentive for diversion. But as Nikichi has well indicated, I'm afraid in the 80s and 90s, it turned into a bidding war in Congress as to who could think of the most capital offenses. And to see the cross ideological lines um, now turning back in the right direction is very heartening. But I wanted to ask Mr. Love, Eleven. Um, one of the big obstacles, even as state budgets pushed in the direction of shutting down prisons, have been the giant corporations that build prisons uh, and make very large campaign contributions and make very large lobbying expenditures against the kinds of things that you hope to move in the right direction on. Um, do you think it's possible that uh, the conservatives who are concerned about the expenditures and maybe ALEC, which is right now looking for some favorable publicity, uh, can offset that kind of lobbying pressure to keep building prisons? Well, that's a good question. Undoubtedly, there have been a number of um, uh, factors going into as far as interest groups that benefit from, you know, mass incarceration. Uh, and so certainly uh, those private companies, uh, you're right to bring that up. Uh, we've also seen, of course, labor groups, uh, prison guards unions in Michigan and California fight against uh, certain reforms that would reduce incarceration. Uh, and frankly, you just see the uh, communities that uh, where their prisons may be closed fighting because they see them as, as sources of jobs. So I think that we've got to address all of that. And so uh, our view is that, for example, uh, states should not enter into long-term contracts with private operators that guarantee a certain um, occupancy rate, for example. I mean, I'm sure Hilton and Marriott would like to be guaranteed a certain occupancy rate, but you don't want to lock yourselves into something that's going to prove costly and, and actually create a disincentive for efforts to safely reduce incarceration. So uh, I think that's a, a, a important thing to, to address. And uh, uh, I will also say that uh, one of the problems we see in a lot of these contracts is it's solely a per diem. It, it, what we would recommend is whether it's with a nonprofit, for example, that comes in and runs a program in a state prison or whatever, that you have some, uh, some of the compensation be based on outcomes, such as reducing recidivism. Um, so I think that's an important part, rather than just always giving the contract to the low bidder who may have poor conditions, who may have poor results in terms of recidivism and so forth. Um, so I think ultimately it all comes back to the fact that we really do need to move from a system that grows when it fails, grows to the extent it fails, uh, you know, as we talked about in, at the front end of the policing system. I mean, in New York City, if uh, things that reduce the number of arrests, reduce the crime rate, reduce the number of warrants, reduce the number of gun charges, those are 
overall measures currently used that would say it was a failure, but it was a success. Um, and similarly, if you have a prison that with the highest recidivism rate, that means more business for that prison. Uh, so again, uh, we have a system that grows when and to the extent it fails, we need one that rewards results. Earlier, we should mention for those of you uh, who are interested, earlier this year, the Brennan Center and the Vera Institute published uh, with, the, with Jim Austin a study of what did bring the incarceration rate down in, in New York State, and it's very interesting. Uh, there are a number of other questions. Yes. And uh, Hugh Lester from uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, my question is uh, for Jim. Uh, bureaucracies are self-perpetuating. Uh, what will counteract their bias towards maintaining the as-is condition? What bureaucracy will celebrate being starved? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's a broad question. I'll just talk about policing bureaucracies for a second, okay, because that's the one that I know most about. Um, I think this is a, a discussion that uh, communities and good, healthy police departments have a very strong connection to their community, and you ask that question, how many cops do you need? How big does the police department need to be? How much do you need to spend of your money on us to keep you safe? And these are fundamental questions that I, uh, in my previous uh, career, had council people ask all the time. And, and I think up till now, it has been very difficult to answer some of those questions. Science has advanced dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. We know a lot more about the science of, of effective policing. We know a lot more about the science around controlling crime and disorder. And so I think when a community and um, its local political structure, so, and that's really, I think, one of the most important discussions is about how does the local city council and mayor view these issues that we're talking about. When they um, start asking that question and the police department understands that this is gonna be part of their interplay between uh, them and um, the community, how many cops do you need? How big of a budget do you need? The, the, the question has to be, what, you, what is it that you want us to do? If, if you want us to throw everybody in jail, then we need more cops because it's, you know, it's, it's an assembly line process. If what you are asking us to do is to create a safer community, one that supports strong families and, and controls crime before it occurs and gets to the front end as much of that process and shrinks the system as much as possible, then we may need fewer police officers and we need a lot more community-based services like mental health services and drug courts and other kinds of things that work together with the police to create safer community settings. So I don't know that I've answered your question, that's a broad one, but it, you know, we have to think differently about um, perpetuating these organizations. Very interesting. I'm wondering if any of the other panelists uh, have anything they want to add on, on this. And we have, uh, one, one thing I would say is that if you take a look at the first section of this report, so many of the innovative public policies over the last decade or two have sought social goals through, use, through better understanding of uh, economics, their earned income tax credit being a good example. There's a real wave in the economics field uh, of behavioral economics and the ways institutions respond, and the ways individuals respond to subtle, subtle nudges. And in some respects, this, uh, this report shows some of the ways we can learn from institutional and behavioral economics uh, in, in criminal justice policy. Yes, please. My name is Alice Ortusar, and I'm a researcher and writer. And I've seen wonderful solutions coming from the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention in the 1990s. There's wonderful research in the ERIC databases that if you take a low SES um, group of students, put them in a gifted and talented environment, and um, classroom with the resources and the expectations, you will have just about the same results. But we seem to be able to ignore what we already know, and often it's because a reluctance to spend the same amount of money on every student, yet they're willing to spend it on incarceration. So um, my first question is how do you address and change that mindset? And secondly, how do you affect the crime rate when we're sending all of our jobs out of the country in our trade so-called bills and so few people are saying anything. And with the visas, the immigration bill, I understand, has hundreds of thousands 
of H-1B visas to bring people in, despite our high unemployment rates. So how do we address those issues? I'm guessing we're, we're probably most qualified to address the first set of questions. Enemai and other, other folks? Sure, so I'll see, just take the first question. Um, in terms of what you're talking about with cost savings, I actually think that some of the movement that's been going on in the last couple of years, though it is heartening that um, the idea of economics and fiscal savings is now part of um, criminal justice reform, that there's actually been too much of a focus on fiscal cost savings um, for the sake of savings, as opposed to taking a more of a return on investment lens. And so there are a lot of states that are cutting reentry programs, for example, for cost saving reasons, not understanding that actually investing in reentry is not is not just to improve the lives of people in those programs, but also to actually bring down recidivism and reduce costs in the long run. And so one of the things that we're trying to advocate for in this report is to take this return on investment lens and really start thinking through, um, it is important to sometimes spend money at the outset to really get results at the end. Um, and Nikiji? Yeah, when you were speaking uh, in the first example, dealing with the students being put in uh, the expectation that they will succeed, you know, et cetera. I don't know, I think I read it in your report, I'm not sure, but um, our criminologist Todd Clear once said that if you take the outcomes of what we're doing in the criminal justice system and you put that in the private sector, they would never stand for it, okay? Because they don't work, okay? and. Um, I think it's the same um, philosophy with respect to what we're doing here. We need to make sure that what we're doing are things that work, that they make sense, and um, uh, that they move the needle forward. I know there's a question over here, yes? I... Oh, in the middle. I'm Tracy Velasquez. I'm a consultant in criminal justice issues and used to be with the Justice Policy Institute where we brought up some of these issues and we're really glad to see that you sort of took them and created some solutions to what we mostly complain about is problems. So um, my question is about um, some of what was already discussed around sort of the silo approach that still, even within this, within the, the Burn Jag program, focuses on these as criminal justice issues with criminal justice money. I noticed in your solutions and some of the questions, it has questions like how many people were screened for mental health problems or substance abuse problems. We know that the funds for mental health and substance abuse treatment are being cut right now. And I was wondering if there was any thought about sort of creating, um, you know, maybe this is really pie in the sky, but creating some sort of a program that joins with, say, SAMHSA or other agencies so that we're looking at um, incentives that also have carrots with them, whereas where they might be able to get some money for, say, mental health treatment or substance abuse treatment so that they'll have, when they, when they do, for instance, have people and they want to divert them, they don't face people who don't have the same pot of money as them saying, we can't afford to do that. Great question. So um, just to respond to that, Part of what we are proposing that we're hoping could help with that issue is we think that asking questions about mental health screening will actually incentivize states to start investing in that. So if that's what they're being measured by, that that's um, what they're actually going to do. And as Michael said, kind of creating a nudging effect. Well, yeah, I would say certainly, you know, if you look at what Texas did in 2007 in terms of justice reinvestment, it was about expanding uh, mental health treatment slots, uh, expanding substance abuse treatment, and basically we had prosecutors and judges coming up to the legislature saying we were sending a lot of low-risk, nonviolent folks to prison that we would be willing to divert if you just created those uh, resources. And so that's, uh, and we were able to do that, of course, at a fraction of the price of building more prisons, which, which had been projected. So um, I think that that's certainly a, uh, a, a great point to raise. And uh, I think it requires that when we're looking at state budgets, we don't just look at how much the Department of Corrections is spending, but we also look at what other agencies are spending, whether it's in the treatment area, workforce, uh, education, and so forth, and see where uh, we can try to uh, really maximize our use of resources. Great. Yes. Hello. I'm Niaz from the NAACP, Criminal Justice Program Director. And first of all, congratulations on your report. Um, my question has to do with some of the data we see from the Justice Department on an annual basis, particularly looking at crime data that is put out annually, right? 
But when we come to track um, case resolution, you know, how many of these violent crimes have actually been solved? Because for us, we deal with a lot of communities that live in these high crime areas. And we hear about law enforcement priorities, you know, we got cops standing in the corner profiling us for, you know, and, and, and you know, arresting us and convicting us on low-level nonviolent offenses. We want to know how many of the murders and the rapes in this community go unsolved. So is that part of the solution? Uh, you know, has there been discussion with the Justice Department about, you know, it, it seems like, you know, you're getting data from the law enforcement departments, and this might be something that would be easy to include. Is there resistance within the DOJ or perhaps from uh, police departments? I just wanted to get some clarity on that. So that actually is one of our proposed measures, the um, whether investigations have been solved for crimes. But actually, if Jim wanted to talk a little bit about that. So, so I think that there's kind of a widely held belief that the UCR uh, metrics today are kind of outdated, right? That we, we are all driven by this very narrow collection of data so that the uh, information systems that police departments have are framed around that, collecting data about that. Most police departments, uh, I think it would be fair to say, collect the information you're asking about. They know what their clearance rate is. They know a bunch of these kinds of metrics. Whether they publicize those, whether they share them, whether those were formed in concert with the community is a, a really important question, right? I mean, um, when you talk about the co-production of public safety between the police and the community, you have to think about these outcomes, not just driven by the police, but driven by the community. What is the most important thing that we should be working on? How do we then work backwards from those to make sure that the measurements and the metrics we're using facilitate an evaluation of what we're ultimately doing? Because the thing we don't do well is we don't evaluate um, the strategies we use very well. We, I think police departments and good thoughtful police chiefs are trying to do that. It is difficult because they, you know, there's no class to teach you how to do that, right? The socialization of police chiefs in this country is all framed around the tactics and the suppression side of the equation and the investigative piece, right? There's not I know certainly not in my career, and I came from a state that had a really extensive educational system for police officers that was mandated. I never once took a class that told me how to evaluate whether the strategies were working actually had an effect. You know, we can run the numbers, we can do all that, but um, I have greater sensitivity to this because I run a scientific organization now, but answering the question, does that work or not, is a different question that relates to evaluation that is important to these questions you raise. But, can I just add, in addition to the percent of crime solved, another statistic that I think law enforcement may be able to have some bearing on is the percent of crimes reported. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of distrust uh, of law enforcement in some communities, particularly the extremely high crime areas you referenced. And one of the exciting strategies uh, we've seen is uh, David Kennedy uh, at uh, John Jay College. Uh, it's been called Operation Ceasefire, whatever you want to call it, but the call-in meetings where he's got ministers, grandmothers, as well as a federal prosecutor, but people that they, they have, many of the people that are invited, they have the goods on that they could prosecute, but they say, look, here's an alternative you can take. And of course, they've got their mothers, grandmothers um, kind of emotionally urging them to, to go and talk to the woman at the back of the room who's uh, from social service agency, the, uh, someone who's from uh, workforce, help them get a job and all of that. And it's had tremendous results in terms of uh, these really low level uh, drug dealers getting out of it and greatly reducing the uh, open air drug markets in some of these communities. And so yet, as you think about that, you have fewer arrests. Now the 10% that don't desist, they get you know, a, a federal prison term and all that, but they have fewer arrests. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of these traditional uh, performance measures that are used wouldn't really capture the benefits of that. And of course, one of the great benefits is increasing uh, the trust and cooperation with law enforcement uh, in those communities. Uh, great. More questions or comments from Nikichi? Yes. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Collins. I'm a policy manager at the uh, Drug Policy Alliance. Um, Nikichi touched on the link between um, criminal justice funding and the drug war. I wondered if the others on the panel wanted to speak a little bit about where they see the connection, if they see a connection. Don't all well, speak at once. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, obviously there's a whole host of issues with that, but I think that uh, 
undoubtedly everyone can agree it'd be better to have fewer people addicted to uh, illegal substances and so forth. And so certainly that type of, of measure is 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 part of you know what we've seen a lot of states focusing on part of several of the model bills that I mentioned uh, to actually look at those programs that do effectively help people uh, get off of drugs and so uh, certainly um, if, if you look at uh, I, I read read an article in, in Scotland they used to uh, publicly report what percentage of inmates prison inmates were using drugs and it was so high it was embarrassing so they stopped doing it so we I think we wrongly assume that just incarcerating mm -hmm someone is going to uh, fix that problem uh, in many instances. So uh, I think it is, it is absolutely important to, uh, to think about that in this discussion. I would just add to that that um, I think a program that is sending 60% of funds to law enforcement and one of the major activity measures is the number of arrests and number of seizures and number of warrants can create um, some inadvertent signaling in terms of where police should focus their resources. And let me just add on to what I was saying before also. One of the specific things that can be done is not counting marijuana arrest in particular as part of the uh, performance measure. Um, it's so very easy. It, it leads to stops and frisks and um, disproportionate targeting of certain communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing that could be done right now is I see just stop including that as one of the categories of arrest that um, is part of the performance. Can factor. I just add one thing on that is we work with the Sheriff's Association in Texas to adopt a bill that gives police the option to issue a citation and notice to appear for certain low-level misdemeanors, including marijuana. Uh, so kind of say the way it's been said is you can uh, beat the ride but not the rap because you still have the charge. But I mean, again, just the fact of arresting somebody and bringing them to jail takes that officer off the streets for hours, costs a significant amount of money. And of course, if that person is indigent, they could languish in jail a long time if they can't come up with a bond. And also, in, as we seek to strengthen indigent defense, it pulls defense lawyers away from, from toward that, that kind of offense as well. Yes. Uh, my name is Marlene Beckman. I'm currently with the Inspector General Office of the Department of Justice. But my question goes back to the days when I was with LEAA and in Law Enforcement and Assistance Administration. I'm probably the only one in the room that goes back <laughs> that far. But nonetheless, in those days, some of you will remember that there was a requirement for the burn grant program to have a comprehensive plan. There had to be a plan where all of the players in the criminal justice system worked together and submitted that plan to the department before the funding uh, was given out. And I'm wondering if you considered that when you were looking at uh, developing incentives in your report? Um, yes, we actually did. And um, the first section of our performance measures focus a lot on strategic plans. And um, I think that the value added of a strategic plan is, as you said, to make sure that states are focusing on the right types of goals. And a strategic plan is kind of a means to an end, right? It's a way to make sure that people are focusing on the right goals. So we definitely did. Um, include that, and I think the very first section of our measures are ask a lot about strategic planning. And I think several of them also address collaboration uh, across agencies as well. So I think that's very important because someone referenced silos earlier, and uh, undoubtedly uh, one of the areas we've seen some uh, a, a very good measure was in Illinois. They adopted something which is creating an electronic risk and needs assessment that follows that offender from arrest to parole just throughout the system. And someone can go back subsequently and say, okay, here was how this person's risk and needs were assessed at that time. Here's what was done in response, and here's what the results were, and learn from that as you go forward with that individual. And we have time for two more questions. We should also mention this is another benefit of the Blue Ribbon panel and the uh, significant peer reviewing and interviewing that we did because the focus on strategic plans was something we heard from a lot of people. And to the, to, when we launched into this, that was a bit of a surprise to us. And it was really striking how, how uh, powerful a tool that, that seemed to be. So we have time for two more questions. Yes. If you have the mic, you can do it. Uh, yes, I understand. Uh, I'm Peggy Burke with the Center for Effective Public Policy, and I understand and ap applaud the focus on the measurement issues and how that creates a certain incentive to carry out certain things. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the degree to which you ha have addressed um, 
any guidance to jurisdictions about strategies, about what the effective strategies are, what does the research tell us about effective approaches in various aspects of the criminal justice system, and um, whether or not your proposal addresses that. Um, so part of what we thought about, um, we know that the program is really designed to give discretion to states and cities, and we wanted to be able to give um, the recipients an opportunity to kind of figure out how in their jurisdictions, given their individual problems and their individual challenges, how to best achieve what we saw as kind of top level criminal justice goals for those agencies. So we focused more on the outcomes and um, trying to really give that kind of discretion to police departments and states to really figure out how to get there. And Jim, do you, have, do, you, do you see the police uh, and local jurisdictions being able to to take that kind of uh, next step, uh, or do they need more to be able to do that? Well, I think they need some more, but I, I would just point out, that, I mean, there's been a tremendous advance in policing in this country over the last 20 years. I mean, I, I think about what it was like when I got in the business and what it is today. It's maybe not everybody appreciates that, but it is a much better uh, business today than it has been. Um, the chiefs and sheriffs of this country, I think, uh, by uh, large part really are focused on trying they want to do the best job they can to protect their communities there is a disconnect though between the way we educate and socialize uh, police leadership and the evidence about what works to control crime and disorder and there's a variety of reasons for that we don't have time to talk about but that that exists and so um, the federal government through either uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the COPS Office, the National Institute of Justice, OJJDP, um, membership organizations like the International Association of Chiefs of Police or the Police Executive Research Forum or non-membership scientific groups like us, the Police Foundation, work very hard to try to advance the way that police chiefs, sheriffs, superintendents, commissioners look at the limited amount of resources they have, the job that they need to accomplish, that they're hired to do, and do so in a constitutionally correct and effective manner so that they don't alienate the communities that they actually work for. And I think that there's been a lot of advance along those lines, but there is still a lot of work to do. And, and I think that, uh, you know, if we don't lose sight of it, uh, this decade's going to be a very different place uh, in that regard than the previous one. Um, but the job's not done, and, and certainly uh, the people that should hear this report, I think in many regards, are mayors and city managers of local police or local cities who then are the people who hire and appoint police chiefs and the voters of counties that, that uh, elect sheriffs. And when they start to demand that you, chief, will in fact, or you who wants to be chief, will in fact promote evidence-based approaches that are constitutionally correct, that are compassionate, uh, equal, and above all, do no harm to your community while you're trying to protect it. Um, I think we'll see massive changes. And I should say that we do have multiple copies of, of the report uh, for anybody who has networks around the country or any other community of people who, who they think it might be useful to get it to. We would be delighted to send it to them or make them available because we love mailing parties in our office. Um, one last question. Jasmine Tyler from the Open Society Foundations. Thank you so much for this discussion. It's been very interesting. And thank you to the Brennan Center for doing this report. I worked at the Drug Policy Alliance for years and years where I tried to bring attention, um, along with Michael Collins back there who asked a question, to the problems of the Burn JAG program. In particular, particularly, I want to ask one question. Nikichi touched on the racial disparities that um, have, or the civil rights abuses that have come about. But one of the biggest problems, I think, of the uh, performance measures is that there's no requirement for capturing um, race data um, in the arrests made. And so we know that the mass incarceration crisis of you know, our country has really fallen disproportionately on the shoulders of black and brown communities um, from coast to coast. And so I wonder if you all are interested in just, as a last question, touching on that, the need to really um, document what's going on with our arrest uh, rates and, and the funneling into the prison systems. Sure. So I'll just take that quickly. Um, yes, so we did look at that. And there is actually a question in the performance measures about the breakdown um, in racial, uh, the racial groups of people being arrested. The one thing that I wanted to kind of add to that is I think it's really important to document that, but I also think it's more important to change that. And so our performance measures are really focused on changing um, 
the way that the practices are made. And I will um, actually uh, quote um, Vanita Gupta, who many of you guys know, who says that any criminal justice reform to reduce mass incarceration is a racial justice reform because you are actually, because the impact is on so many people of color. Any reform pushing things in a different direction is going to affect um, the racial impact of it. And that's really what we focused on is the change instead of just the documentation. So uh, we are out of time. Uh, and I want to start by thanking the panelists. And if I want to I I thank the authors of this report. Uh, our premise at the Brennan Center is that uh, one of the things this country needs right now is solutions. Uh, in, in the host of areas on which we work, we're seeking to help drive innovative uh, policy reforms that we can all carry into battle. And we want to thank all of you for being here. We're delighted to have further conversations to answer any questions or engage in any colloquies, but uh, have a good afternoon and thank you.